I'd like to discuss, uh, it doesn't have to be brief, we have as much time as we want, but the different origin stories of this brew called ayahuasca, which exists in many different iterations used by many, many different tribal groups and cultures at this point, and churches also syncretic religions at this point. But I'm wondering how you would explain the development of this particular combination of of plants. And the reason I ask mm-hmm. is that I, I've heard many different explanations for this. So one is just trial and error over a very long period of time. Another, on the opposite end of the spectrum, would be the plants told us. <laughs> and I'm wondering how you would explain the the arrival at this combination of, say, vine and chakra DMT containing plant. Well, first of all, you know, one thing I mentioned about ayahuasca or yahe is that the mm-hmm. The idea we often have of it as we, you know, go down to uh, Iquitos, Upucalpa, the healers of the Shipibo, you know, as if it's sort of a quest for personal liberation, personal well-being, that's always been there in the traditional use of hallucinogens in South America, you know, the, the traditional syncretic cult of the cactus of the four winds and the curanderos who use San Pedro cactus on the mm-hmm. coast. And certainly the popularization of ayahuasca began with the Yahe letters between William Burroughs right. and Allen mm-hmm. Ginsberg. And it was Burroughs who turned up in Bogota, goes to the herbarium, meets who he calls Doc Schindler, who is Schultes, and Schultes sends him off and eventually gets gets him ayahuasca in Mokoa. And on that road between Sibandoy and Mokoa in the upper Putumayo, when I was there in the 1970s, there were already, you know, individual healers sort of working with the gringo trade, but also working with individual campesinos. And of course, in all of these healing practices, the idea is that the imbalance of the individual is treated through the medicine and whether the imbalance is caused by bad health poor finances, personal problems, whatever. It's a balance, a source that one gets to. But I mention that only to stress that it is completely a different situation when you get into the heart of the Northwest Amazon, where presumably these plants were, were originated, these preparations. So, for example, one of the powerful themes that is somewhat like what the Kogi do, this idea that you know, that, that human beings aren't the problem, we're the solution, because only through the human imagination can the wonder of the natural world become manifest, that, that we are the ones who have to maintain the energetic flows of the universe. We have this proactive role to play. Well, in the Northwest Amazon, it's very much that way. I mean, the, the, the main origin myth that in one way or another is shared by multiple cultures speaks of a great journey from the east up the Milk River in sacred canoes dragged by anaconda. And in the canoes are all the hierarchy, the, the, the chiefs, the wisdom keeper, the dancers, the warriors, the slaves, and also the three vital plants, coca, yahe, and tobacco. And these are brought up the Milk River. And originally, they were brought up by the Iowa, the Four Thunders, these mythological culture heroes, and they encountered a world of total devastation. And they turned that world upside down and brought order to it by destroying the negative forces. So this idea that humans are responsible for the equilibrium. And then the Iowas went up and became the stars, and then the great mother Romikumu brought the people up, and the people settled each river. And because each river was settled by a unique canoe, each language group are related to each other. You can't marry within your language. So one of the extraordinary things in the Northwest Amazon is, is uh, linguistic exogamy. When you marry, you must marry someone who speaks a different language. But the use of ayahuasca is not individualistic. It's collective. At these mm-hmm. great ceremonies that go on for two and three days, where the individuals, the men, all the people are there, but only men take 
Yahe. They go through two different kinds of ritual paraphernalia, feather work, by day, by night. And they literally, by taking ayahuasca, don't become symbols of the ancestors. They become the ancestors. And they fly away to all the sacred sites to pay homage to the natural world, to maintain the harmonic balance. So the critical thing here is that the use of the plant preparation has nothing to do with any individual's well-being, but rather becomes a prayer a ceremony for the collective well-being and survival of the culture. And it becomes a mediator to the divine. And so the kinds of things you see in the kind of gringo ayahuasca business around Iquitos is not traditional in that sense. Now, as to how this knowledge was discovered, I mean, there are a couple possibilities. First of all, there is a species of Malpighiaceous vine, Diploteris cabrera, mm -hmm. which looks very much like Yahe and does have DMT in it. So maybe they saw that, then they saw the opposite leaves, they saw the psychotria, coffee plant, opposite leaves. Clearly there's experimentation going on. But it's not just with ayahuasca. Take something like curare. The remarkable thing yeah. about curare, it's a muscle relaxant. But to affect the muscles, it has to get into the blood. You can drink as much curare as you want. And if you don't have some kind of wound in your stomach, you'll be fine. But again, how do you how do you rationally explain that process of elaboration? You know, and, and you mentioned trial and error. Well, I think statistically that is just exposed as a meaningless euphemism. Now, I mentioned yep. that story about Schultze saying, you know, the Siona Sequoia and the 17 varieties sing to you in a different key. Well, whatever that really means, when the people say the plants teach us, I'm quite prepared at this point in my life to take them at their word. And the reason I say that is that, that these men, largely men, also women, but, but in terms of the ayahuasca, these aren't sort of random characters. These are true natural philosophers who yeah. understand that flora in ways that few scientists could ever aspire to do. They have spent their lives in wisdom traditions lineages that have been taking all of this common genius that I keep talking about, we all share as human beings, and applying it to that challenge. I mean, for example, I mean, just jumping away for a second, you know, when you go to Australia, you realize that the entire purpose of life is not to change the world, but to do the rituals to keep the world just as it was. Well, imagine how much would be learned if the people of New York City had spent all of their existence putting all of their energy and capacity into understanding the biological relationships of Central Park. I mean, it'd be incredible, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so when we say the plants teach us, I'm not sure what that means. I don't quite know how it would become operative. But I do know, and I've had this experience myself, taking any number of psychoactive substances, that you have insights that become almost challenging to believe in the wake of your experience. <laughs> yeah. I never understood the glory of photosynthesis. I never appreciated the miracle of this verse of life, this idea that, you know, water can come together with carbon dioxide and create the air that we breathe and the food that we eat. I mean, that's a poetic verse every child should have to memorize, and no politician should ever be able to run for office if they can't recite the formula of photosynthesis. And But the point is, I remember I took, Tim and I discovered a new species of San Pedro cactus in 1974 in Bolivia, and we took a big walk of it on the eastern side of the Andes, and knowing that it was safe and you know, Tim, I mean, Schultz used to say Tim and I ate our way through South America. If anything, <laughs> back then had a chance to get us high, we would take it. it was, I mean, I don't know, we were crazy, we were kids. But anyway, yeah. we took this, I took, as Tim and I made ready to say goodbye to each other after over a year and a half traveling together, we took this extraordinary, uh, Terrence would call heroic dose of uh, this new species we had found. And 
we were up for 48 hours. And at one point, <laughs> we just left the ground and we were like flying over the surface of the earth. And I looked down and I saw the Nazca lines, you know, and I became convinced that that's how, that explained how these guys conceived those uh. monumental structures. But but at that same experience, I saw Tim fly up like Icarus to the sun and disappear. And I knew right then he was going to die. And he would be mm. dead in, in short order, in fact, from AIDS.